by Professor Renee before she heads up back to the snow, all the snow, <laughs> which we hopefully get tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs> and so for this last lecture, I'd like to talk about it. Instead of the temporal characteristics of these tabletop hierarchic source, sources, talk about the spatial coherence of these light sources and, and what that can do for us, and in particular, how we can make essentially better extra microscopes. Or, and, <clears throat> And uh, so for this, I'd like to uh, point out this is the imaging team in our group led by Dr. Dan Adams. Many of these students are now graduated and gone on to better, uh, bigger and better things. And uh, if I have time, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, another application of harmonics in understanding energy flow. Um, and uh, 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 this was the work of Debbie Annardi and Kathy Holcomb. Um, both have since graduated, but we are continuing the work because it's sort of it, um, it's of interest for them in structured design, and we also have a lot of help. This, this, these applications I'm going to talk about in this talk are a little bit more technical, um, and they are a little bit more demanding than the spectroscopy because it turns out um, the amount of light you need to shine on a material to image, as opposed to you know get back a spectral response, is just greater. So. For that, we just need more help from KM Labs, who does the engineering of the source, so we can try and get as much light out as we can to see if we can illuminate a microscope, and also um, LPL and NIST who can make us nice calibrated nanostructures. So this is um, sort of a, um, a, a, a more technical application. But we've been talking, all of us here, a lot about harnessing um, x-rays and electrons for very fast um, to, to capture very fast dynamics. Ideally, we'd like to be able to image very fast dynamics, but I'm not going to tell you that today because we, we still are just implementing static imaging, but we're still doing that static imaging with 10 femtosecond light pulses, so in the future we'll be able to combine both the um, uh, time resolution and spatial resolution, but for today I can only talk about uh, static imaging, um, at least in a full field imaging microscope. And again, just to remind you, um, you, with all these beautiful super resolution microscopies that can you know, make these beautiful images of cells and the beautiful electron micro microscopes that can image matter and look at the position of individual atoms, you know, why do you need <coughs> x-rays? Um, well, they can penetrate opaque samples thicker than you can with visible or um, electron beams. They have this inherent sensitivity to your uh, charge, <coughs> you know what you're looking at, and to your spin. Um, and in principle, they can image to the wavelength limit. And of course, if you have a fast X-ray, you can capture dynamics. But until very recently, there was no way to actually build a, an X-ray microscope that was good, uh, that was as good as a visible microscope. You couldn't actually get anywhere near the wavelength limit because there's no good lenses. The lenses were based on zone plates. Um, zone plates are fabricated using electron beam technology, and the resolution of the zone plate, or the smallest spot size, if you want to think about it that way was dependent on how well you could make the, this diffractive optic. And um, if you, you know, talk about anywhere except some of the best two or three labs in the world, from a practical point of view, 30 nanometer was sort of the spatial resolution you could get with an X-ray microscope. And that's nowhere near the wavelength element. And on top of that, um, it, because uh, your focus spot, focus spot was very small and your um, convocal parameter, the depth of focus was also very small, um, just to build a microscope that could get to, you know, below 10 nanometer, it cost 10 million just to build the room to hold the microscope because there couldn't be any vibrations. So just very, very hard. The zone that itself cost $100,000 and it can sort of evaporate in your hand as you walk across the lab room. So just, yeah, just really hard technology. It works, but very hard. And that's why you don't have US. You do have um, you know, uh, commercial electron microscopes, but it's hard to get below 30 nanometer in spatial resolution. 
What do you mean the zone plate evaporates as you walk across? It's so the delicate that oh. if you walk too fast, it can <laughs> literally evaporate away in the yeah. wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the hard, so, so it, it, it's hard to mount. It's hard to get. It, you know, it damages its finite lifetime. So it's it's a it's a costly technology. You know, um, and of course it, it, it's necessary for some things. And so, but but the, but all of this, you know, together, it, it held back progress in X-ray imaging. Um, but fortunately, um, there, you know, because now we can make so what's the difference? between 10 years ago and now, we have access to all kinds of spatially coherent light sources. Uh, big, big and small. And of course, I mentioned the small. And that allows you to throw away the lens. So um, back in late 1950s, before the laser was invented, uh, David Sayer you know, proposed, I think that there's just one line, so it's not like he had an in-depth research proposal, but he had, he commented that if you had spatial coherence in your illumination, and you had illuminated an object, then in principle, you could, you have the amplitude of the scatter pattern, but you don't have the phase, but you could use, if you had constraints on the setup, you could guess the phase, and if you guess the phase right, and now, of course, we use computer algorithms to do that. You can make an image without a lens. So we're, we're using a computer algorithm to, to, to allow us to make that Fourier transform. Um, I'm telling this story because the first person to implement the idea, because there was a lot of things fine up and lots of good optics, beautiful optics work done that made it all possible. But the first person to implement this idea um, uh, in a 2D image was John Miao for his thesis in 1999 using the Brookhaven uh, light source. And th the thing I think is cute about it is that David Sarah was on the paper. And so for the students in the audience, it took 50 years. <laughs> Sometimes that, that, that's just what it takes. Um, but what John did was, you know, spatially filter the X-ray beam from the Brookhaven light source to make spatially coherent illumination and illuminated a little a pattern and then uh, use this aphasia retrieval algorithm to recover a 2D image. And why is this sort of really interesting for all kinds of X-ray sources, the free electron lasers, the synchrotrons, and the pyromonic light sources, is that you can get to diffraction limited imaging. So you can get to the half the wavelength. Um, you can image in 3D, um, you get a phase and amplitude image of your object. Uh, it's robust to vibrations because uh, the CCD pixel sizes are on order of, let's say, 13 microns. So you only have to stabilize your sample in illumination to make sure that the, the light doesn't move from one pixel to another, and that's much less constrained than having a confocal parameter of a few hundred, a few tens of nanometers and a spot size of 10 nanometers. So it's like, it's an order, it's three orders of magnitude easier. So you can have a coherent microscope on your table, have it hooked up to roughing pumps that are, you know, noisy and still take a, a wavelength limited image. And it is the most photon efficient form of imaging because there is nothing between your sample and the detector. And because there's nothing, um, you know, it gives the, le the lowest radiation dose for the number of photons that are required for an image. So, um, so how does it work? Well, um, there's fancier versions now, but, it, but this is sort of an easy way to think about it. Um, that, uh, so you take your scatter pattern, and you know the amplitudes. You have no idea what the phase is, but you can assign a random phase. And then, with phases assigned to the, the scatter pattern, you can take a Fourier transform and look at the image. Now, er, in the early days, there was there, one had to put a constraint on the object that it had to be isolated. Uh, so a typical example would be put a cell in an X-ray beam. You know, and, and so then there was nothing, no object around. You knew that the, there was a finite size to the cell, you know, 10 microns, whatever. The rest of the area did not scatter. So then, what that helps you to do is, if you recover objects out here where you know there was not supposed to be any, you could just set those 
amplitudes to zero, take the Fourier transform again. Um, so, so, so cut out the parts that you knew were due to incorrect guesses of the phase, take the Fourier transform, and replace the um, theoretical scatter pattern with your experimental, but now you have a better guess of the phase. And then just go around. So this is a 2D phase retrieval algorithm used in many, you know, in frogs, in frog, in um, astronomical observation, in many, many um, uh, applications. And so, so this works um, uh, pretty well. Um, of course, you, you're, you're not getting, you know, you are, you, you know, if you compare with the, like a traditional X-ray microscope, you, there, there are trade-offs. So in a traditional X-ray microscope, you get a full field image and it's direct. You don't need to process the image. Um, however, all, there are the limitations we talked about. Um, for the coherent diffractive, diffractive imaging, I say until about maybe four years ago or so, people didn't really believe it would be a serious, you know, quality competitor for zone plate imaging, but that's changing now because there are more, there are fancier and more powerful algorithms that can guarantee a, a good uh, reconstruction that you believe, and I'll explain those in a moment, or at least a little bit of it. But, so yeah, so now you really can push the, the spatial resolution well below five nanometer in a full field image, um, two nanometer if you just have a very simple <coughs> particle. And this is well below what you can do with, with some place. But you do need um, a reasonably coherent beam. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be reasonable. And of course, you need an algorithm. And, and the amount of time it takes to do it, that you really do need sort of a, something programmed with GPUs so that you can actually um, do the multiple iterations um, quickly. But those are getting less and less expensive, so it's becoming more and more practical as an imaging technique. We started our work on this in, back in 2007, and our initial images were sort of a, a very kind of simple. We would have objects like this opaque object with little holes drilled in it, because that gave our isolation constraint you know, really well. We just shone the, the harmonic beams through these holes. Since the rest was opaque, there was, you know, you, you were up, it was a perfect isolation. But at least we could show that we could get to very close to the wavelength limit in spatial resolution and show with knife edge tests and other tests that we could actually um, make a full field um, microscope. And it turns out that this is still the record for any tabletop microscope. Super resolution can do better if you, if you add fluorescent markers. But if you don't do that, if you're talking about just an inherent microscope, this is still uh, the record. Um, but, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, then we got a little bit more sophisticated. Um, it turns out that you can, um, you can, instead of having the object isolated, if you uh, imaged your harmonic beam so that the beam was really well defined on the object, then the beam was isolated, but not the sample. And you could then, not, you know, for for a cell or a nanoparticle, it's fine to be isolated. But if you're trying to look at a, a circuit or a nanostructure or a photovoltaic, take, photovoltaic and, and, and sort of, then you don't, you can't isolate the object, so you have to find another way. So isolating the beam works, and this just showed that we could, um, you know, look at this, um, this uh, okay, so this one, this, this kind of electron microscope image of the same thing, little holes poked in a piece of material, but now the piece of material is transparent to the x-rays. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a structured sample, and there was big holes and small holes. This small hole did not was make it through the whole way because it was you know very small. So on the back side there was no hole. On the front side there is a hole. This is our CDI amplitude and phase images. You can see that because the X-rays go through, they see the hole in both cases. Whereas with um, the uh, um, the SEM, you would not know there was a hole if you looked at the back side. Um, and it come, we, we, we did. Uh, you know, I think we talked about a couple of days ago about um, you know, whether people believe results or not. Well, the imaging community is a really tough community. Um, even if you compare with scanning electron microscope, atomic port microscope and such, they still might not believe your image. <laughs> so, which is like crazy to me because, you know, images are images. If, if they reproduce what you see with another technique, every technique has its own 
kind of issues. Um, scanning, a, for example, electron microscopy could be scanning electron charges. So you often blur the image due to that. The atomic force microscope actually damages the, damages the sample. So you know, the, the image again is not what you need. You know, so so it's sort of funny. But anyway, this is. Wizard of Oz thing. It's all done with mirrors. Well, it's done with the algorithm. They don't think the algorithm. See, you know. And, uh, yeah. So, anyway, um, I, 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 but, but, but some of this is sort of interesting because it's sort of interesting how the community has their different like pet peeves. Um, but, uh, but all of this was done in transmission, and most of the work, in fact, in coherent refractive imaging was done in a transmission-based microscope because people were imaging were imaging cells biological materials. So it was just quite recently people realized, you know, we, we, there's a lot of material sample we'd like to do in a reflection mode. And that's just been um, very recent, it's since 2011 was the first work this was done at the advanced light source um, by the Steve Cavans group. Um, and you can see this first reflection mode imaging, you know, any first work is never, you know, um, uh, but, it, it, but they showed that it was possible, and then by 2013, we started to get things that really looked like, you know, this is a nice microscope. Um, this is um, the other hieromonic work that's done, uh, was done by uh, Christian Spielmann's group in Germany, showing the SEM, SEM image and the hieromonic image. And this is work from the Advanced Photon Source in Oregon. Um, but what took, you know, this work and made it even all of this work, including ours, and made it even better, was a new technique that's called tachography. Um, it was developed by um, uh, um, uh, Rodenberg's group in the UK, and it, it really works as a, as a really tight constraint so the algorithm doesn't stagnate. So what you, all you do is tachography is you just take overlapping images and just scan like you're taking a you know a scanning image. But if your image has 30%, if your beam has 30% overlap with the adjacent spot, it turns out that so constrains the algorithm that it is forced to come up with the actual um, object that generated those diffraction patterns. And it is so powerful that it actually um, corrects for if your scanning stage isn't taking equal steps. It can figure that out, and it can also gives you the amplitude and phase of the illumination beam. So it, it, it's that now this appears almost like magic, but it actually yields images that you know one has to believe. And so it's being used in all the light sources of building coherent beamlines because because now there's an algorithm that people don't argue. Oh, is it the right image of the object? You know, because the algorithm is so st strong. So Margaret. Yes. So the overlapping images are yes. made by moving that the object that says the EUV mirror. No, the sample. The we, sample. We, we scan the sample because um, you know you, you can use a really um, you can use a, um, a very nice piezo stage, but even at that, there's still you know um, backlash and you know and, and, and wobble, but but the algorithm corrects for it. Now, none of these corrections is not real time, so these corrections are laborious, but there is a path. This is why the, all the light sources are developing this technique for their beamlines. So there is a path to to have it, this be real time, but it, it would it takes a, an engineering design to do that because you've got to do the computing, you've got to transfer large amounts of data because imaging is really data intensive. Um, but yeah, there, there 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 is a path. So we th this is what got us very excited that. Um, uh, so, so our students took a silicon wafer and made nanostructures um, of titanium on the silicon wafer, and this is the scanning electron microscope image using the Jello scanning electron microscope, and this is our hyperbolic phase image. And if you look here at the silicon wafer, of course, we're not doing this in a clean room. We just want to learn imaging, so we don't care if we if crud gets on our our sample or if we scratch it and such, but the, the, the thing that was um, exciting to us is that you can't see the scratches using this kind of electron microscope, but you can see them better with the harmonic illumination. And this is just because of the contrast mechanisms. In an electron microscope, you're, if, you're, <coughs> if you're firing your electrons at the sample, then you're relying on a different amplitude of reflection from the sample. That's your contrast mechanism. Whereas with the harmonics, 
the contrast is a tiny path difference due to a, a profile change on the surface, and of course it's shorter wavelength light, so you get really, really high sensitivity. Um, uh, so, th so th this is the Jill spanning electron microscope. Of course, there's amazing spanning electron microscope, the best in the world. You know, that cost like ten million dollars. That you could do as good, but you know. Um, and so, and this image had 1.3 wavelength horizontal resolution because we used 30 nanometers harmonic beams. And because it's a phase contrast image, you can get um, very high spatial resolution vertically, so of the five angstroms. Um, and it only took a minute of harmonic exposure, in fact, 30 seconds, that's for 200 spots. But if only, we wish we could actually do that, we can, because the commercial um, X-ray CCDs take half an hour to read out that data. So unless you had to go into a fast CCD data acquisition and do something you know, with the lab, so that it, because they're beginning to work on these problems. But the nice thing is, um, it was the first time where the, the harmonics were not the limiting clubs. <laughs> which was, um, but the uh, and it, it appears to have less damage than the atomic force microscopy or the standing electron microscopy. Um, very long working distance, which is nice. But then this is our limit, it's the 90 minutes readout. And this is Dan Adams, uh, the postdoc. Uh, Matt is now working at Slack, actually, he's an Avon scientist. At LCLS. And then Oshang is now working at SAIS. Dennis is working on his PhD, as is Liz and Chrissy. So, so they were the team that uh, did this. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the algorithm, not in real time, but just showing how it's reconstructing. You know, you can, you can, you know, the, you know what we want to do is move to a situation where, you know, we, we've done one corner of the image and then we're one corner of the sample and then you can start reconstructing that and then as you scan you could um, reconstruct um, the whole image. And this is just showing that because in the EUV um, the refractive indices um, are very uh, are changing very rapidly and they are very different for different materials we can make a um, a height and composition and tomographic map and this is just you know looking at it with, with different rend rend renderings, but it shows, you know, this is crud that was on the sample, so the blue stuff is different from the purple stuff, uh, as is here. That's just, it's probably vacuum grease and other things that accumulated by our not, not having a, a um, clean environment. And then more recently, um, what uh, Liz and uh, the st uh, students did was uh, try to show, at least in a demonstration, that, you know, that what the EUV microscopy can do that you can't do with visible light. So our colleagues at um, uh, Semitech gave us this, uh, it's called a damascene sample. It, it's a very commonly used sample. So what it, what it is, is a copper inlaid in um, TEOS um, material. And so we took that sample and, and, and they, they didn't need a skin clean, so we put it into our very dirty coating chamber and coated it with 100 nanometers of aluminum. So if you look with a visible microscope, you just see a mirror. Um, and now, one thing I need to tell you before I show you the other images is that you know they what they do is they make little um, uh, you know uh, vias in the teos and then they coat with copper and then they polish, but they're never able to polish perfectly flat. So the copper areas are all, all often bumped up by a nanometer compared to the other area. And they rely on that often, often because they can still see with an atomic force microscope because that can see the little bump very easily. So that's, you can see, sort of see the image here. This is the uncoated atomic force microscope image. And this is the coated atomic force microscope image. You can sort of see the image, um, particularly on the screen because it's Better, a little bit better model, even right? Um, and uh, but it, but you are seeing the surplus of the aluminum there. Um, but then with the high harmonics, um, because here this was an amplitude image, not a phase image. So the amplitude image will will the only contrast we must be getting is from the buried interface layer. 
uh, from, from this layer here. Because the, fa the phase image, you, 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 you would, uh, well, the phase image, of course, we, would, we could see the bumps also, but that's sort of a trivial, we'd also just be seeing the surface. But the amplitude image lets us see underneath the buried layer. Um, and, and one thing they did, they realized is, you know, this is the EUV you know, reflection from the copper and, and teals. And we noticed that here the copper is bright and the teals is dark, and here the copper is dark and the teals is brighter. But the refractive index shouldn't change because we, all we did was coated it, but this implied it did change. And so then we realized that possibly what might be happening is that the, that the copper is very soft, so the aluminum might be diffusing into the copper. And in fact, we could show that sure enough that's what was happening. But this we made a, this is called a destructive audio-electron spectroscopy technique where you drill in and see what particles are coming out. But we were able to see that there was um, interdiffusion without needing to destroy the sample. That was nice. And then more recently, the students have been just working on refining the images. So this is, you can, if I, can, if I put them side to side, you can see that we're getting better at the algorithms. This was, so this is the original algorithms now as we put more and more corrections and you can see they're getting sharper and sharper. So, um, uh, and uh, we're, we, th these are very preliminary data just showing um, we're, we're looking at more and more interesting samples. Now this is a, um, a harmonic image of the of a, of a zone plate <laughs> and uh, just showing that we have a nice beam. Th these are still very preliminary. But the sort of neat thing is that, with, again, as we do uh, um, with the spectroscopy and um, x-rays, uh, to take advantage of the fact that you've got multiple colors, and so what we can do, the algorithm is smart enough, actually, if you shine more than one harmonic order, that you can retrieve an image of each color. So this is just a demonstration for now, but you can see how that would be very nice for a composite sample, because you can, and particularly if you can do that then in real time, you can actually see if there's uh, energy flow, charge flow, spin flow. You can actually see that. And then the other cute thing um, that, so Bo Sheng um, and uh, Dennis and Liz did this. This is um, a, a visible experiment for now that Robert Carl did. But what he did was show that you could actually take two colors and shine around the sample and recover an image of the two regions at the same time, so that would speed up the scanning. So that's kind of, and you could imagine all kinds of applications. So that this this area is of typographic imaging. I'm just telling you the harmonic part because it's sort of the link to the AMO, but it's in in all areas, visible, X-ray, electron. It really is just um, seeing just a lot of advantages because you can do um, so many different um, variations and such. And so, let's see, so people are probably getting um, hungry now, so let's uh, see how long I should um, talk. What time? Like five or ten minutes? Twenty minutes. Finish. Oh, no, I won't talk that long, but anyway. Yeah. But I talk about, and, and again, I'm going to talk about a long, I, I, I talk about an application that, that, because, you know, we just heard so many beautiful um, experiments on how you can um, harness very high time resolution. So now I talk about an experiment where you couldn't do it as a synchrotron, harmonics are the only way to do it, but you don't need super high time resolution. You only need like a fraction of a picosecond, but you can still learn something about materials that you can't, you know, that, that, that in, in a unique way. So this is this idea of a nanoscale energy transport, and all we're taking advantage of here is that we can see very small variations. If you heat a nanostructure, make it hot, um, that's just a, the most trivial um, experiment for a harmonic. It's just sort of seeing if you change your grading, not, you know, how, how much sensitivity do you have to that change in profile. But, it, but actually this understanding of nanoscale energy flow, even heat flow, is really important. Many different applications, and you know, they, there is all the um, models in industry assume um, it's just diffusive bulk transport. Um, but we, we know actually that's not what is happening on um, a nanoscale. Um, and you could uh, think about it, um, so as you 
uh, uh, we all know that in, in a diffusive re regime, the heat flow is driven by thermal 